Okay, well, uh, as always, if you have any question, I have the chat open on another monitor, so feel free to ask things in any moment. Uh, today, we are going to complete, finally, the, the set of slides about multimodal interaction. And last time we stopped here, we were speaking about um, voice-based interaction. And we, we said that basically uh, all the voice-based interaction, either the most complex like Siri, Google Assistant or Alexa or whatever, uh, are uh, essentially require the user to speak a restrictive set of spoken command uh, where these devices here, the software here as support a large set of spoken commands while, while things like dictation IO or something like that just for dictating and translating in text what a person is, is saying uh, require uh, as support a, a smaller set of, uh, um, of commands like start speaking, new paragraph or something like that. And, and last time we, we had a look at this dictation IO and this translate.google.com uh, because all basically most of the voice-based interaction in which you have to speak with a computer and a computer has to answer back in speech uses two types of interaction, the two types of technology, the speech recognition, speech to text, and the speech synthesis, text to speech. So when you speak with a computer, typically what happens is that uh, the computer listen your speech, translate this in text, and then manipulate the text in some way. Maybe it's a very shallow manipulation or it's a much more complex manipulation using natural language processing, using machine learning to understand what you are speaking about and then to provide an answer. And this answer, if it's spoken back, it will be first of all provided in text and then it will be uh, spoken as uh, in language, in the language that is selected by the, the speakers of a computer or a device. And this is where we stopped last week. Uh, obviously, we were speaking about voice interaction, voice-based interaction, obviously spoken interaction, so those based on speech and not only on voice, uh, is successful in many cases and has some issues in many other cases. And so this set, this lights just to report some example. Uh, for instance, spoken interaction is really useful and successful when user have some physical impairment, also temporary or situational, as we have seen in the last few weeks. It's also useful when the speaker hands are busy, so you are doing something else with your hand and you want to get information, you want to have an action done, and so you can speak and have this, this action completed. Uh, it's also useful when mobility is required, it is required when speaker's eyes are occupied or when speaker is focused on something and needs some additional information be less important like what time is it or uh, something else that doesn't uh, remove the attention uh, of the user from a specific um, from a specific task and and also could be useful when the user is unable to read or write uh, also as a learning opportunity of a learning system hmm? having the, the computer that speak uh, it, for instance pronounce word for you, for children, also for people that start to learn a different language, uh, learning how to pronounce some words could be useful. Obviously, they have also some obstacle hmm, that are mostly related to the environment, not to the technology. So for instance, uh, the interference from noisy environments. So if this is maybe a classroom or we are polytechnical in a crowded corridor and there is a noise environment and we have issues with microphones, with audio, with speech recognition and the translation in text. And also poor quality microphone or problems, temporary problem microphone could interfere with any speech-based interaction. Uh, from uh, between among the, uh, let's say contextual obstacle Talking is not always acceptable. 
And sometimes talking is not acceptable in, in the space. Like we are in a meeting, I cannot talk with a computer and saying totally different things because I'm interrupting the meeting, but also could be not acceptable for privacy issues. So let's, let's imagine that you have to give a computer vocally uh, something that is personal, the, your password or something like that. Uh, it's, it's not acceptable that you speak out loud uh, your password, your, your, your code of your credit card or something like that. It's simply not acceptable talk, talking about this, frankly, in, in a space with other people. Um, other operations like maths or programming are difficult uh, via voice, also between people, but especially with, with a computer. And, and then there are other things, other obstacles and other issues that are, uh, let's say, characteristics of the devices or of people per se. And so for instance, commands, we have seen commands last time, new paragraph, uh, what time is it? it needs to be learned and remembered. I cannot say everything to uh, things like Siri or Google Assistant. I need to learn what I can say and I need to remember that some things produce a results and other things don't produce a results. Uh, the recognition may be challenged by strong accent or unusual vocabulary, like an Italian person speaking English or vice versa, an English person speaking Italian, just for make an example. Uh, error correction can be time consuming. So let, let's imagine the the word processor that we have seen uh, last time, which you speak and whatever you, you say is written on screen in text. And if you need to correct, go back, now go back another letter, not delete the third letter of the second word that I've said. Uh, so it could be time consuming and not trivial to do. It's much more easy to go back with the mouse or keyboard and delete the letter that is interested to, to delete, for instance. Uh, speaking and speaking and listening is a cognitive load, a bigger cognitive load with respect to typing or pointing uh, for people in general. And, and also we have, for instance, a slow page of speech output where compared to visual display. So if I have an icon with a message, it's much easier and quicker to look at the image, look at the sentence, then waiting the speech output to pronounce the entire sentence of, I don't know, the, what, what is in television today. Having to wait 11 uh, different channels and program uh, with respect to seeing a list of 11 titles uh, with the logo of the television program uh, in, besides. So this could also be obstacle and issue that some of them are avoidable, others are, are, are not, uh, others are contextual, others are linked how, on how people perceive the use speech for their life experience. Essentially, if you want to design or if you use uh, something that required voice-based interaction, these are more or less the six steps that you encounter. So the first step is the initiation. You want to start, you want to let the software application, let the device, let the computer know that you want to start that speech processing uh, process. So typically for the dictation tool that we have seen last week, you press the button, start recording, or for Google Assistant, you say, okay, Google, or hey Siri, so say a wake word. Uh, then you have, uh, as I said before, know what to say. Uh, learnability is still one of the main issues of technologies that mimic natural language. Because again, they have a set of command, maybe big set of command uh, that accept, but they don't understand everything in natural language. So you have to know what to say and uh, they have to remember uh, what to say. Then you have to tackle Either if you are designing or using, but especially if you are designing a voice-based system, uh, you have to tackle with errors. Errors related to recognition, in, especially in the speech to text part. Uh, so in English, it's easy that a system uh, make a mistake between dime and time. 
uh, and they will happen. And maybe the sentence change, and maybe the, the intent, the meaning of the, the sentence is not recognized anymore. And the device, the system, give you a totally different and wrong answer just because you uh, say time and uh, the device recognize time instead. So you have to recognize error, especially in the speech to text and eventually cor correct error if possible. Uh, once you have the text in the speech, from the speech to text, the correct text, you have to map the that, that text to possible action. So if the text is, what time is it? You have to, uh, or, or the system map the text to specific action like asking to a weather service to, uh, sorry, what time is it? Asking to the clock, uh, which time is it? And, and then give it a feedback. It's, I don't know, 5.30 for instance. Uh, similarly, if the action is not understandable, or not clear, or I don't know what I will hit tonight. Uh, probably a, a device, a computer system doesn't know the answer to this. And so uh, provide a, a gentle message to say, I don't understand, or I, I'm looking on, on the internet on these are the 10 most popular recipes in your areas and you can try or something like that. So mapping the sentence as derived in text to the right, let's say, action and this is one of the most difficult part and so system like dictation uh, basically don't do this or do this very very uh, in a very very small way like for commands in the paragraph or something like that uh, things like uh, google assistant siri alexa instead use a much larger and more intelligent uh, way to mapping doing doing this mapping they typically uh, recognize if a sentence is part of a given intent. And so you have the intent weather, the intent weather is triggered by 10 different variation of sentences, 11 different variation of sentences that, that are pertain to the weather. And you have maybe also an indication of the day, if you are want to have the, day, the weather, and also of the city or the place in which you, you want to know if it's raining or not. And and so this mapping should, should pass through this understanding of the sentence and then the, the capability of, of the software to um, connect to the right provider of that information, if it is an information, or to the right provider of detection, if the action is turn on the lamp, for instance, um, and going back to the user, always going back to the user in some way with some sort of feedback or some sort of dialogue, if this it's maybe a multi-part uh, conversation. So again, if you are asking what's what's on TV tonight, uh, probably uh, you will have the a first page with 10 results and then a second page with other 10 results. And after the first page, you have a sort of dialogue in which the assistant, in which the voice based system say to you, do you want to continue with the next 10 items or you want to stop here and, and, and that's it. And if you want to continue, you can say, okay, continue. And you have a list of other 10 uh, results from the list. So this is basically what happens when you design, also when you use a voice-based interaction, a voice-based interaction system. Moving away from voice-based interaction, and because we will go back uh, in a while, uh, uh, are things that is strongly related to voice and speech and to, to synthesis text to speech in that part are screen readers. We mentioned screen readers a few weeks ago when we spoke about designing for diversity and also last week when we spoke about the braille um, keyboard, hmm? the, the braille speaker, this one the braille display. Because the screen readers are the thing, the software that enable this to work and also enable, uh, a, let's say, a, a, a blind person to, to understand what's, what, what's happening on a computer, in an operating system, in a program, on the web, and similar things. And, 
And so th these are software applications for handling vocal synthesis and then again, braille display. And they are typically used by people who are blind with severe visual impairment. They are nowadays built in in basically all mobile operating system, either in Android, it's called the TalkBack, and in iOS it's called VoiceOver, and also in some uh, operating system on the desktop like macOS. So they are built in and they provide this function for all the application uh, of the operating system. Then if you want, there are also dedicated hardware like NVDA or JAWS uh, that uh, will allow you to use a screen reader maybe with more sophisticated option or personalized option or because you are a long time user or JAWS and you want to continue to use that and not to update to the version that is provided by your operating system. Um, obviously, advantages and disadvantages. These are standalone program that maybe don't have full access to everything in operating system. The one that are embedded in the operating system can have more easily access to everything. And also it could be used maybe through some APIs by the developer to better incorporate them in their own application. But essentially screen readers are software that read what is in a screen and either send, let's say, the results of the re this reading uh, through a vocal synthesis, so through speaker or earphones or uh, in braille display. And with it, with them, a person can navigate in an operating system or on a web page, uh, for instance, passing from an icon to another. And so when the first icon is selected, the, the screen reader and the speakers will say, uh, the name of the icon, then you have selecting another icon and there is the name of the other icon and so on. And similarly from an icon to another, to a win from a window to another. Uh, and also for receiving information on the context in which she is through again, the braille display or a vocal synthesis. And screen readers um, uh, are, are, are really useful on the website for giving access to the website for to people that has some issues with vision, either temporary, contextual, or uh, permanent. And a lot of websites nowadays are still not accessible to screen reader users. And advanced screen use reader users are uh, using screen reader in a very uh, sophisticated and quick way. And I have a, a, de a demo here that we uh, I'm I would like to, to show you. It's a very, it's a long demo, but we will just see a moment of it. So tell me if you don't listen the audio of this video. This is Mark Sutton from the University of California, San Francisco's IT Web Services Department. Do you hear this, this audio? Okay, perfect. So essentially this is a person who is blind from University of California, uh, San Francisco and Il now we show us how to use, how he to use the screen reader. And, and you will notice that uh, since he's an advanced user, it will use the, the screen reader in a very uh, rapid way. Uh, also setting up the, the speech, uh, the, the speed of the speech of the computer very, very fast. So let's just see a, a moment and so for instance, here he start navigating the, the application, the, the website of his application. Screen reader does is for example, I'm gonna read this, start to read this page. Navigation bottom, link, University of California, San Francisco, link, about MCSF, link, search MCSF. So you see here, uh, you, you listen, but also you see here that the element that is selected, this one here is a link so it's specific, what is this? And also the text of this link. So this is recognized the, the semantic tag of the, of the link, the A, and say, okay, it's a link. And the text of the link of the button, whatever it is, is search UCSF. And, and as you have probably listened, we can play it a little bit. It's very, very fast as a way of speaking. And what I will now do is slow down the speech rate. 80%. 75%, 70%, 65%, 60%, 55%, 45%, link, UCSF Medical Center. So as I was about to say, a screen reader converts what's on a computer screen 
into information that can be displayed through synthetic speech or Braille. And essentially, here, now he has reduced the speed of the voice, but his artwork is start from the top corner and select one element in a row on all the screens. So I start from here. Okay, this is the first link, this is second link, this is the third link, and then this is navigation. Then you have uh, probably uh, go here, introduction, then that's your website, your site, and guide, and the resources, policies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the screen readers use all the semantic knowledge and semantic elements that you apply from HTML5 and, and previous also. So it recognizes this is a link uh, with the A tag, but also recognizes something is navigation or something is a tag article. So these are information that are not visible to the user, as you know from the uh, web application course of last year, but also, uh, but especially for giving semantic knowledge also for these kind of tools that adopt uh, this semantic information to give additional information that are not visible. And this is a four minute video. I, we are not going to, to see it all, but it show how uh, it, it navigates. So for instance, this is a heading level one inside of a main. And this heading level one is the H1 that you write in HTML. And inside the main, that is the tag main that you write in the HTML. So all these information are really useful, uh, not only for give a style uh, to, to your web page, but also especially for enabling other kind, kind of usage like this one. So this is a, a nice video, it's four minutes, so maybe you can, uh, maybe not today, uh, tomorrow or this week, let's say. Uh, have a look at this video, it's just four, four, four minutes. And there is also a screen reader basics by Google, if you want, very, very short. And I, I would like to finish this, this set of slides that were about multimodal interaction by inviting you to try one of these screen reader on a website or on your uh, smartphone. Just enable uh, TalkBack if you have Android or VoiceOver if you have uh, an iOS by uh, an iPhone and try to use your phone for three minutes, for five minutes, just with uh, that, uh, that system without looking and see how, how it is to to navigate an operating system. And if you want also a website, maybe some website that is particularly hostic or, or strange to, to navigate. Okay, any question up to this point? Also from the previous lectures about multimodal? I would say no. Okay. So now, let's start with the next topic. So we move, we started from just to, to, to recap, we started with our process of human-centered uh, uh, design uh, based on prototypes. And uh, we end up, we did a lot of things about vision and we then spoke about uh, multimodality. So putting together different input and output mechanisms, especially as input or as output to provide a, a rich and a redundant uh, flow of, of interaction. And before starting to speak about evaluation, that is the last topic of the course and that we will start speaking probably tomorrow or next week, uh, we, would, we would like to dedicate at, at least one lecture that is today and maybe also tomorrow, uh, if we don't finish, uh, speaking about interacting with artificial intelligence. Uh, because well, for different reasons, actually. One of the reasons is that AI is obviously, is, it's everywhere. Let's say if you have, uh, if you use Spotify or Apple Music or whatever, you have a recommendation system for your music. Uh, maybe you are studying data science 
and machine learning. So you are familiar with some of these uh, technology. And st strongly connected to the multimodal, uh, we are going to see how these things, this is uh, an Amazon Echo that now is muted. Uh, we are going to see how these things work. And this is a, a sort of multimodal, uh, not, not really, but sort of multimodal device uh, for, for input. Um, maybe not this one that just has some button on it, but there is a version with a screen um, as we have seen in, in the slide. So, and this also has some AI component for understanding the speech. So these things here, not only does speech to text and text to speech, but also has some intelligence behind some machine learning feature for doing natural language processing and for mapping the right sentence with the right action, let's say in the word. So we would like to dedicate this uh, one hour and a half, let's say one lecture about speaking about, speaking about interacting with AI technology in general or systems that are powered partially or totally with AI, with AI technology. And as always, I will have some question for you. So if you, uh, then you want to, to, to answer, uh, I will be glad to, to go into, into a discussion with you. Uh, so this, this set of slides, we speak with an introduction basically, and then we will move on uh, to an experiment. Let's try this, this thing just to be everybody on the same page. And then with an exercise probably tomorrow. Uh, on analyzing the voice interaction, the, the assistant like uh, Alexa, that is on this uh, Amazon Echo. So let's start from uh, a fact. Hmm? That is that nowadays AI is potentially everywhere. Hmm? I don't know if you recognize some, some of these, but well, this is, this is uh, the bigger brother of this, this, uh, this device that I have shown you. Uh, this is the Amazon Echo, but you can have also the Google Home or uh, the, the Apple HomePod if you are not living in Italy. Um, that basically are digital assistant, voice-based, connected with IoT devices, with smart home, with lamps and services on the internet. Then this is, you know, Probably this is a Google Assistant, so the, a brother, let's say, of this device, but embedded in, in the smartphone. Uh, and then you have here, this is Create ML uh, system, uh, a software application by Apple to create a classifier uh, of images, mainly uh, with drag and drop very, very quickly without writing code uh, and so on. Uh, these What is this? Yes, this is the Uber autonomous car that is driving alone. Uh, typically now there is a person uh, uh, that is driving, but let's say it is typically driving alone. It's a self-driving car uh, that in some cities like in, in Pittsburgh in the United States, they are driving and taking on passengers like like taxi um, and and this is instead of medical image uh, i don't exactly remember what they are but essentially it's classifying some kind of issues in this uh, medical uh, this for for a patient so grade four grade three grade five so something it's worse than, than other and, and these are just example of artificial intelligence. We have a voice assistant either in devices or on a smartphone. So either uh, let's say uh, voice only, so they don't have a screen. The only way to interact with these things is by speaking or uh, screen first, in which you have like in Google Assistant, the first, the preferred way of interacting with this is to a screen. And then you can also do it uh, via voice, but especially with, with a screen. So you have this that is powered by artificial intelligence. This is to create uh, artificial intelligence system. This that use quite a lot of things, uses uh, cameras, uses radar, uses uh, algorithms to, to try to, to drive safely 
in a city, uh, respecting the limits and, and so on. And this also is to recognize and classify uh, problems in a medical image. And notice that when I, I'm, we are speaking now for, for this lecture about AI, we are just using this as an umbrella term that encompass basically everything from machine learning to deep learning to natural language processing to knowledge representation to optimization to whatever you, you have in your mind or you may have in your mind. So some behavior that is not simple or predictable like in the traditional user interface. And why we, we should care from a human computer interaction perspective? Uh, well, we, we should care for, for, for a lot of reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is that uh, if, you, if you want, if you want, if you look on, on the internet, uh, you, you can find papers that say that HCI and AI were, uh, let's say, should, should work together more and that they are string, str stringly, strongly related in the past, just two faces of the same, the same coin. Uh, and so the, the, it's, it's an important topic to, to cover for HCI, but also because when you have something to do with an AI power system, a graphical user interface, so let's imagine for now in a graphical user interface, also a vocal user interface like this uh, of the Amazon Echo, uh, you have some features of these devices, of this software, of these interfaces is that, and the main feature is that uh, they are typically performed, they work under uncertainty. Uh, and they produce false positive and false negative. Uh, and they can demonstrate unpredictable behavior. They can be very, very serious or not serious at all. So let, let's think about for a moment, uh, the music recommender that you probably experiment in Spotify or whatever, uh, in any music service or on Netflix for, um, for recommending uh, videos. Or spam, yeah, an example of false positive, of false, false positive is a spam email that is not spam in reality. So you, you have to do with this, this technology. And if you find some, some things like this spam email that doesn't uh, doesn't is doesn't be uh, the isn't a spam is something that is uncertainly. So with respect to your user interface, in which when you press next or when you open a list of things on your prototype, that list will be more or less the same. And the user, if it open the pre the favorite uh, places on a map, it will always see that set of favorite places. It maybe it can add something or move something, but for let's say a specific time, it will say it will be the same, and the changes are powered or let's say um, depend from the users. That is removing things, adding things, adding content to the application, or from the developer that is adding functionality to the web application. But it's predictable. When you press next, you will see in your application that you are developing. You you will start to developing, but you are dying. You you did wireframe and paper prototype, you will always see the same sequence. Uh, you will not happen that something is in a, one day uh, a place and something else is not, and another day is not, uh, because it's marked as spam or something like that. So uh, this uncertainty is typical of AI system, how they work, because they work in this way. And, and this, this uncertainty can bring unpredictable behavior. They can be uh, confusing, like in the spam email example, uh, but also disruptive or dangerous. So you, you know what this is in this picture. It's quite small and not immediately, but it's a car. Again, it's not Uber this time. It's a Tesla, yeah. It's a Tesla car that uh, uses or, or try to use the, the smart summon system that allow the car to drive from a parking lot to the, uh, to, to the driver that is waiting for, from the car. And the car, it say it was parked here and should have done this uh, road here, turn here, and then go here to the, 
to the driver, to the owner of the car. Uh, and, and typically this is the, the, said, the, the expected behavior, uh, but uh, for some reasons that the user cannot know, we cannot know. For some reasons, uncertainly, uh, the, the car thought that the, the grass here was the street. So instead of continuing on the street and then turning here, it just turned before and got stuck on this, uh, on, on the grass here. And, and that got, got stuck, it, it stopped here and it, it cannot move anymore. It needs some, somebody that go inside the car and action the car and, and so on. So this is, this is not, in this case, it's not really dangerous. Maybe it could be expensive if the car broken here. Uh, it could be dangerous if maybe somebody is here on the grass or if there is something uh, delicate in front of the car or, or, or something like that. But in this case, it was not dangerous, uh, but surely is problematic. It's problematic because this is a not unexpected behavior hmm, for the user. So this behavior doesn't match the mental model of the user and doesn't match the feature that the car is sold with. So this system, the smart summon system, say you press a button on your smartphone and the car comes to you magically and without any problem. Uh, and this is not true because you are not expecting that the car is stuck here in, in, some, in some places. Uh, you expect that the car comes to you. And maybe that car performed this action correctly 10 times before this, this day. And maybe it also work typically, but let's say it works 99% of the time is not 100% of the time. Like let's say a user interface that is not powered by any uh, artificial intelligence. So this is a car, but same concept apply to user interface. Uh, another story about uh, artificial intelligence. Um, uh, there, there was uh, last year in the United States, a uh, machine learning system that uh, was very, very able to uh, identify radiography. So RX scan, uh, problems in radiography uh, much more than the, pe the person, the doctor. So if the, if, if the doctor see uh, a radiography with a problem, uh, the, the, the machine learning algorithm was able to identify the problem uh, more time than you know, the, the, the doctor. And, and this was tested in an hospital. So let's say person A with a specific problem uh, got the, the radiography, uh, the doctor say no, it's not a problem. And uh, the machine say, yes, it is. And actually it was, so the, the machine was more accurate than the, the doctor in that case. Um, it also was on, on newspaper last year, this thing here. Uh, a few weeks after, they installed the same software in another hospital. And basically the results were totally random with the same disease and with the same radiography, type of radiography, obviously. So why this happen to you? which could be the cause of this in one place with radiography A and disease A, it works in another place, same software, no changes at all. With radiography A and problem A, it stopped working. Ideas. No, no, same, same picture, same, same picture, same perspective, same training, same test set, it's the same software, same algorithm, same everything. Just moving from computer A to computer B. No, not different input data, more, more or less 
more or less. Uh, but so the, the, the nice thing was that, and this is something that is could, could be dangerous if they. No, it's not a problem. Configuration perfectly able to. It was pretty pretty fine. You you give the image and the machine say. I don't know, this is A with a probability of 90% or uh, everything okay with another probability. Something really, really simple. Uh, the problem was, yeah, the pro no, no GPS. This problem is related to the wrong interpretation of the data, actually. But this re requested weeks to understand this. So basically, what changes between hospital A and hospital B is that in the hospital A, uh, the machine for doing radiography uh, was a, a specific brand. And in the other hospital, the machine was of a different brand. So even if they produce the same picture with the same perspective, with the same quality, etc., the one in the first hospital put something on the um, on the images, like the name of the brand or some other details, when the machine noticed something strange, do, do something before. The other machine didn't put this brand on the, on, on this brand, these numbers on, on, the, on, on, on the picture on the radiography. So what, what they discover is that basically the machine learning algorithm didn't recognize the disease. They recognize the presence of these numbers or these brands or these pictures or these letters on the first machine. And when you put it in the second machine and the second machine doesn't produce any of these, just the full picture, the, the algorithm stops working. So this obviously is a problem of training data and, but also understanding which is this data, which is the interpretation that the, the algorithm is doing uh, with data. Because most of the time, people that are working, and probably if you have done a machine learning course, also Polytechnic, uh, you can ask yourself how many times they mention people in that course, or they mention human in that course. Hmm? I, I asked this question to PhD student in AI last year, and the answer was zero. So in a machine learning course, in artificial intelligence course, they typically don't mention people, but any artificial intelligence system is made by people. Uh, data is chosen by people. Sometimes data is collected from people and results are analyzed by people. So people have a role, may have a role in that, in that, in all the process, in the entire process. Uh, so this is something to consider when designing artificial intelligence system, but also when incorporating artificial intelligence in uh, existing application that should have obviously interactive artificial intelligence system should provide something to the users that users exist and users uh, are a mess like uh, we have said many, many times during this course. And these systems are uncertainty and predictable sometimes and they're difficult to understand like a black box and this could be a problem of matching with a mental model uh, or also a problem in dangerous situation or creating confusing situation for, for users. Uh, another characteristics of AI system, interactive AI system is that typically AI system violate some usability guidelines. For instance, they typically violate consistency and sometimes also error prevention. Uh, so without speaking about med the medical area that is obviously important and dangerous, uh, they can behave inconsistently. So if you think uh, at the auto completion on your keyboard on a smartphone, for instance, the auto completion system suggests different words from time to time. When you press a letter, maybe you see some suggestion and after one month, you see other suggestion. So this is something that violates consistency because uh, at a given action of a user, you should see the same set of results. But this is interact, this is, let's say, this intelligent, this is learning uh, from the usage. 
Uh, so it, maybe the suggestion change because you you typically when you type the letter H, uh, you see you would like typically at the beginning just three three random words, and then after one month you know that when you type H, uh, H you want to write I don't know hotel and so put hotel in the first place. But this is a violation of of the guidelines of your computer interaction because this is not consistent uh, as behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, or if you think about search engine, when you type something on Google and you see uh, our, our results, and if you do it on another computer or another person is doing it at the same time and type the same exact key search word, uh, results are not 100% identical. They differ a bit. And this is due, due to personalization of, of the algorithm of search engine. And this is something that we accept and we maybe are also happy that the auto completion system uh, try to suggest the word that we are using most and not just the first three word of the, uh, of the dictionary because it's easier for us, but this violates some usability guidelines. And so we, we need to take all uh, all, all of these uncertainty and inconsistency that the AI system uh, has and exhibit when they have to interact with the user. So how we can design, and we are not going to design uh, an interactive system uh, now, obviously, but how can we design interactive AI system? So uh, on all these, 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 uh, this topic, uh, last year we had at Polytechnico uh, a PhD course on human AI interaction. So we spent like 20 hours speaking about this, this topic. We are just condensing the main uh, things in one hour and a half in one lecture, just to give you an idea. But how we can design interactive AI system? But, well, first of all, we, we should always remember to follow a human-centered process. So differently from the process that is uh, taught in machine learning courses that is data oriented or feature oriented. We should also in that case remember that if the, system, if the AI is going to be used in an interactive system, well, we should consider people in all the, the stages, also in the selection of the data, also in the collection of the data, also in the cleaning of the data, also in the training of the system not to avoid bias for designing with diversity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then if we, the, the, the most important thing when you are designing an interactive AI system is to, is to decide if you want to include AI or you don't want to include AI. Because there are things for which including AI is a very good idea, uh, like in the suggestion for the keyboard and, and so on. And other moment in which probably it could have been better not to include the eye to, to have a result that is simpler and would be more effective uh, because it's not needed to include the AI in everything. So deciding where to include the AI or not is just is the biggest decision that you, you can have when, in, in, when designing interactive AI system. And for which feature it's better to include the AI. So if it's something about the keyboard, probably it makes sense. If it's suggestion or recommendation, probably it makes sense. If it's something not related to, uh, to this thing, but is more linear processes, probably it's useless or doesn't give a big advantage with respect to, uh, let's say, normal and a traditional approach. And if you decide to use AI uh, for a specific feature or set of feature, uh, the next thing is, is to understand when you want to automate. So, let's say replacing the user doing an action or when you want to augment user capability. And then balancing the uncertainty, the inconsistent of AI system with from one side, the proper expectation. So give the user the proper expectation of, of what is going to happen and give the user the proper feedback on what is going to happen. This is something linked to what we uh, we have said, we have seen in um, previously, but obviously this is to be tuned from the specific characteristic of uncertainty and consistency 
and false positive and false negative and all this stuff here that are specific to that single feature of AI that you are going to use in your interactive system. And going back for, for a while to this automate versus augmenting, just to better explain. Uh, there are historically uh, two, two perspectives uh, of AI and uh, people plus AI, let's say. Uh, one is AI should replace the user. We should uh, have some, all the task that the user is doing, just throw away the user and have a machine doing the task. Uh, like for the doctor and radiography, we want to replace the doctor. We want a machine that does the diagnosis uh, on behalf of the doctor. We want to replace the, the work of the doctor. And the other approach in all in the other um, uh, side and totally in the other side is instead providing AI technology to augmenting user capability, to give uh, an additional instrument, an additional tool, an additional perspective to the person. So in the case of the doctor, uh, replacing the user is having a machine that uh, see a radiography and say, okay, this is, uh, this has this disease and that's it. Uh, in augmenting, you may have, for instance, um, an algorithm, uh, a machine that say to, to the doctor, I'm going to notice that this is problematic and this area seems problematic. Do you want to investigate more? Do you want to zoom in? Do you want to know uh, what can infer, infer from this specific part of the picture? And then it's the doctor that say yes, no, or no, I don't care because this is obviously a false positive. Um, so I, I don't care. So it's the doctor, it's the person that is in control of the situation and the artificial intelligence is just supportive uh, of this. And while typically uh, I tend to be on the augmenting user capability, there are situations in which you want instead to replace the user. Um, and do you think one of these positive uh, way to replacing the user maybe? Also not in a uh, graphical user interface, just in something that uses AI or behave smartly. Planes autopilot. Planes autopilot is, is really nice as an example um, because it's, it's partly, it's, it's true, it's partly replacing the user, but not always. So I, I don't know if you if you know how uh, I, I heard, heard stories. I have not direct experience, but what they say that is that pilot, uh, planes work in this way when they fly. Uh, so the, the pilot has full control uh, of the planes, obviously in some stages uh, of the of, of of the flight. In other stages, the autopilot enters. But periodically, uh, the autopilot stops and require the pilot to drive, let's say to fly the airplane. This is because they experience that uh, uh, if the pilot relies too much on the autopilot, um, in case the autopilot is not working for any reason, because it's broken, because there is uh, a problem somewhere, hardware problem, software problem, the pilot is not ready to go back in control because they rely too much on the autopilot. And so periodically, uh, the autopilot say to the pilot, now you have to, to fly it for one hour, starting from five minutes from this moment. And the pilot should always be there in the loop. So the pilot could, could also relax a little bit, but sometimes during the flight, uh, the pilot is requested to, 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 to fly to the, the airplanes. So it's not totally uh, replacing the user because the pilot is there and they want to be there because the, the autopilot could not work or could be problematic or could have uh, some atmospherical events that needs the pilot and the pilot should be aware. And also in other cases, but yeah, it's sort of automated automation. Uh, 
And in other cases, it's also augmenting in which the pilot could do some operation and the uh, airplane uh, perform other operations that are important, fundamental, but they are complementary with the one of the pilot. So in that case, it's more, uh, it's a mix between automation and augmenting. But without thinking about airplanes, things, for instance, uh, cleaning the house. Do you prefer to have a Roomba that clean the house for you, or you prefer to have um, uh, a device that help you cleaning, but you have to clean? So, uh, pro probably, uh, I, I don't know if you want to answer in chat, you can, but I, I, would, I would prefer to have the, the Roomba that cleans the, out, the, the house and replace, replace me without any problem uh, for cleaning the house. Um, so in that case, probably uh, the acceptance of the user could be much higher because it's not something fun cleaning the entire house and having some, something that cleans well uh, is not a problem. Uh, but also in that case, you should have uh, feedback. You should have expectation. You cannot expect that the, the room but cleans, I don't know, the, the window because it's not expected to do that or cleans every single corner of a big room because it's not expected to do, to, to do that. Or a single Roomba can clean at 200 uh, square meters house because it's not, it's not working for that way. It, it's able to work on smaller places. And, and so also in that case, you need feedback, you need proper expectation. And, and so there are something, some, some concepts, some areas in which automation could be, could be fine and could be acceptable and other in which uh, the user uh, should be in control at least. Maybe it's not augmented, but should be in control of the system. So how we can ensure that design? Well, we have guidelines uh, as for most of the things. Um, so these are a set of 18 guidelines from Microsoft Search. Uh, created last year, and they follow a, a very nice process actually, um, because they analyze 20 years of product recommendation and research on human AI interaction, and they created this set of uh, 18 uh, guidelines, uh, and they evaluated the guidelines with users, let's say normal users, uh, and also with experts of the field, so either HCI or AI. And they came up with these 18 guidelines. And then after this also Google, as I said, not guidelines, they call it guidebook because it's also a story how to do this, how to match the user needs with AI features. Uh, so how to translate user needs in uh, data features, let's say, uh, to, to extract, to, to start for instance machine learning uh, algorithm or, and also Apple as a, uh, a guidelines for uh, machine learning in their devices. But this is, is a, a summary of, again, 20 years of, of research and practice on human AI. And so they are pretty uh, comprehensive and they are split, well, they, are, they have a website and they are split basically in four stages. So you can use this either for designing, also for evaluating a system. Uh, the four stages are initially, so when you see an AI system, initially what happens? So when you see this, the question is what this can do. And this is the initial phase. And then you have during interaction. So what happens when you are interacting with the specific feature or the specific AI based device? Then you have, and these are two, two guidelines here, four guidelines here. And then what happens when there is some problem? When it's wrong, the operation is wrong or is unexpected, what happens when you have problems? So to recover from errors, for instance, that is uh, something that you, you may remind from the previous lecture of this course. And they have five guidelines for this. And then over time, what happens over time, given that typically AI-based system or AI-based feature update themselves, uh, update the, the models so or the language model for the keyboard updates to provide you a new suggestion. They are not static. 
And this is not something that happened initially during interaction or went wrong. It's something that happens over time when you're receiving a suggestion for listening new music. This is maybe something that happens in a different way every week. So over time, uh, you have to do something and to communicate these things uh, in a way to respect the to respect or minimize problems, to respect the heuristics or minimize problem when needed. And so these are 18 guidelines. I just reported one for each uh, area. So for initially, I just selected this. Uh, make clear how well the system can do what it can do. And this is the gu guideline. Uh, make clear how well the system can do what it can do. And this is the description. Help the user understand how often the AI system may make mistakes. Because it will. Maybe the uh, machine learning algorithm has a precision of 95%. So there is a 5% possibility that the, the suggestion is wrong. So it, uh, it will make a mistake sometimes. And so for instance, this is um, something that Apple Music does. It is very subtle. Uh, it say discover new music from artists we think you will like. So make clear how well the system can do what you can do. This we think you will like is something to say, is something say like saying, uh, this is a list of music. Probably some of this song could be good for you, others probably not. But this is something that we think you will like. We are not totally sure, but we think. So if there is something wrong here, we make clear that this system, the recommendation system here, can suggest music for you, but you will probably find something from one song to probably 100 song that are not suitable for you. Not suitable for you in general, or not suitable for you in that moment. Because this is initially, but also remember over time, this recommendation changes. So if I receive this recommendation, let's say this week, the week after Christmas, maybe I have here uh, songs about Christmas. I don't want to receive this recommendation on, in August because Christmas is in December and probably I am not in the mood of listening Christmas music in, in August. Or maybe yes, but typically, uh, typically not. So make clear how well the system can do. We think you will like. It will be wrong and uh, violation of this guideline to say, discover new music you will surely like, or this is the new music for you, or something more strong. This is very subtle, but there are other obvious examples. This is just one example of this application, this guideline, of a successful application of this guideline. And obviously the 18 guidelines uh, are, uh, some of them cannot apply in any situation. So some of them, for instance, cannot be applied for uh, voice-based interaction. Others could, could apply in some system and not in the others because they are guidelines or they can also not, not apply in some occasion. Uh, during interaction, for instance, I think a guideline during interaction is try to mitigate social biases. And the description is ensure their system language and behavior do not reinforce undesirable and unfair stereotypes and biases. And so here it show the Android keyboard that is suggest when you type H in English, it's suggesting both him and her. So it doesn't reinforce that when you type H, you want to say him, for instance, but present both pronoun, both him and her in, in, in these three options, where the first one is just the letter. So it try to mitigate social biases because it's not focusing only on one gender, for instance. So if one spot is a pronoun of uh, gender related pronoun, uh, the Google keyboard uh, will always try to put in another spot at least the other gender. And then maybe you have another suggestion here, but this is trying not to meet, to trying to mitigate social biases, right? Not to reinforce unfair and desirable, maybe not for 100% of the population, but for somebody could be undesirable stereotypes and biases. And so it will always 
uh, report here. And this is something that happens only, let's say almost only in artificial intelligence, because if you design a keyboard with four spots here, with four specific um, words there, when you type a letter, you will always have in a non-AI system, the same words in that place. Uh, not, they will not change. So if you design that very well at the beginning, you will always have them. Here instead, they can change because the system can, can learn and change during time. Another example went wrong. This is something that you, this is an example with Bing, but Google search does the same. If you type something in the search bar and you misspell something, uh, typically the search engine say including results for the, the, the word that is corrected with, with a, that has a correct spelling of the words. So including results, so you want to res, you search for Kino Reeves written this way and Bing includes the results for Kino Reeves in, in the search. So it try to help you hmm, correcting your errors. But if you instead were really interested in searching for this version of this person here and not the actor, but this person here, you in with one click if support efficient correction, with one click, you can revert to the original uh, sentence and perform the search with the original sentence. So make it easy to define, refine, or recover when the system is wrong. In this case, the system think that you want to search for the actors, but it may be wrong. So you can recover from this error just by clicking here uh, at the beginning of the page with one click. Obviously, this is not an example of refining or editing, just for recovery from a suggestion. And then over time, this is just one of the guidelines. Uh, we, we are not going to, to see all, all 18 guidelines with an example now, uh, but over time, convey the consequence of user action. Why it's important to convey the consequence of user action? Because if you press something in a non-AI, if you press the like button or the dislike button in uh, in a prototype that you are developing, uh, the action is immediate. You have an item, you dislike the item, you unfollow the item, you unfollow a person and you remove the person from your following list. And it, that's it. The action ends there. You have no consequences. The consequence is immediate and it is removing the person from uh, the, uh, the list. In a AI-based system, you may have longer term consequences. So tapping on a pull music in this way, in this case, uh, I dislike this, uh, this song. Maybe we'll also remove the song from the list of your liked song, if this is a thing. But most importantly, you are telling the system that you don't want, want less of this song in your recommendation. And so the system say, we will recommend less like these in for you. So in your recommended list of songs that we have seen a few slides before, you will see less songs like this one that you disliked because you dislike that. And this is not a, a consequence that happens one minute after. This may be a consequence that you notice or maybe not after one week, after one month and something like that. So given that the consequence could be longer term, you need also to convey the consequence to the user when the action happens. This is an extension of what we are doing for uh, dangerous operation in user interfaces where you press delete and ask for a confirmation of deletion. This is more than this. This is not only eventually uh, optionally uh, asking for a confirmation. It's also saying, notice that this action may have consequency in one month, in one year, in the future, in some way that the system will take into consideration. Okay, so 
Now let's have this 15 minutes playing with the Amazon Echo. And then tomorrow we'll do this exercise. We will try to apply these, we will start at least to apply the human AI interaction guidelines together to the Amazon Echo and to Alexa. So every 18, we will see if they apply, if they violate the guidelines or not. But obviously tomorrow, now it's, it's too late. What we can do is uh, instead having a look at this just to have uh, a full picture of how this thing works. Uh, do you uh, ever use this or something like this? Uh, the physical device, not the, the assistant on the phone. Okay, so you have uh, some of you have a good experience of this. Well, okay, so maybe half an hour, 15 minutes will be more than, than one minute. So this is, so let me close this presentation so that, uh, and stop sharing so that it's bigger. So this is the um, Amazon Echo. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the Echo Dot, the version, the smaller version, oops. The smaller version um, without screen, with a small uh, speakers here. And this is basically a speaker. And it has four buttons. One for what is, increasing the volume, one for decreasing the volume, uh, one for, I don't remember, and the other one for uh, uh, muting the microphone. So these are the only four physical buttons that you have. And then there is this LED here that now is red because it's the microphone is, is muted. And if you press this, the microphone is, um, the dot is for starting without speaking. Okay, thank you. Um, and without uh, pressing this, the, the LED is, is turned off. And if you press plus, you see that it emits a sound and you are increasing the volume. And also this bar here is bigger because you are increasing the volume. And if you decrease, you see that the, the lights become smaller, smaller. So, so you have essentially four button for optic interaction, a LED for a feedback for some kind of feedbacks. Probably could be used more than this, but just for this, for volume, for uh, when it's muted or not, and when you uh, turn on, when you call the assistant, when you call Alexa, uh, the, the LED strip will light, will, will light just to tell you that it's listening. Or when the television called uh, Alexa, is, it turn, it turn on as well. And then you have this light also for augmenting or just turning on off, up and down the volume. And this is set up in Italian, uh, but I discovered that if I speak English, uh, this is able to understand what I'm saying, and uh, but it answers in Italian. So I'm sorry if you don't understand Italian, but uh, I, I, I can answer, I can provide the, the question in English, hopefully, and this will understand and reply in Italian, however. And you can obviously, when you see this thing here, you have no experience, you don't know how to, what to do with this. Uh, it has a wake word that by default is Alexa, but you can personalize it. Uh, I, I change it for, for, for the lecture because otherwise I will turn on this thing many times or every time I say Alexa. And and this is the, the smaller version without screen. There is also a version with screen that is also touch screen. So you can having a little bit of multimodal because you have speech and touch screen and it's also complementary redundant, redundant in some operation. Uh, this needs to be connected to the internet without the internet is basically useless. Uh, it doesn't even tell you the time. And, and when you wake up, you see that the LED strip will turn on. So I, I'm going to say computer. So you see that 
the, the LED is, is on because I said computer and no. And then the answer was no, because I didn't understand what, what I'm saying. Uh, but we can ask, for instance, what time is it? Uh, computer, what time is it? Sono le 6.50 del pomeriggio. Okay, I, I, I'm asking English and it's, a, it, it's uh, 10 before 7 p.m. Uh, in the afternoon. So we can have this small conversation, small talk, what time is it or what's the weather um, in, in Turin. So for instance, uh, computer, what's the weather in Turin tomorrow? Allerta meteo per Torino. Si prevede un allarme arancio per neve, ghiaccio. Da martedì 1 dicembre, 20 a mercoledì 2 dicembre, 11.59. Per domani sono previsti rovesci. Computer stop. And you can uh, stop every interaction with this by saying the wake word plus stop. And immediately it is shut up. Um, so for basically ask what, what's the weather during tomorrow and it started with some contextual information, like there is a orange alert for snow and ice and whatever uh, for tomorrow, from starting from today for, for the entire week. And then it, it started to say the, um, the weather forecast. Um, what else can we ask to you, in your opinion? I have two other examples, but... Uh, that, that shows some features, but okay, computer roll a dice. Computer roll a dice. Mm. It doesn't like roll a dice. Um, yeah, I can ask play music, but uh, if I say computer play music. Riproduco musica da Apple Music. Computer stop. It just, if you say play music, it just executes random music from the first service that he, he is able to, to identify. Uh, but they can also say, for instance, uh, computer play Radio DJ. Radio DJ that you need. Computer stop. And then you also play radio, and this is out of the box without installing, enabling anything. Um, uh, let's put a timer. Uh, I, I'm trying to, I hope that I'm saying the right thing in English. Uh, computer, put a five minutes timer. Purtroppo non trovo la risposta alla domanda. Computer, metti un timer da 5 minuti. 5 minuti, a partire da ora. So I, I put a timer, five minutes timer, and now I start counting five minutes. Um, and it's, it remains silent up to five minutes, up to the end of five minutes. Uh, so notice that here could be a uh, possible, uh, if you want, um, missing feature, because the, for instance, the LED strip remains uh, turned off. So this is a timer, could, could also be something like, like this, uh, that go down the lead, for instance, or on request. And um, I can say, for instance, uh, what's, what's the remaining time for, for the timer? And yeah, there could be a problem with multiple timer with the lead. Um, no, I need, I cannot give command to speak answer in English. I need to set up from the, the smartphone application for that. I need to change the language. I, I, it was just strange that I can speak in English and this thing understand English and provide answer, uh, uh, provide answer uh, from English because it's set up in Italian. So, so it's, it was unexpected, but the other day I was trying and for, for the lecture and it worked. So, um, so this thing needs to be configured uh, via the mobile application. Most of the features should be uh, provided by the application. Um, and uh, what was, okay, I, I was saying, so keep in mind the timer, we set up a timer five minutes 
So if I speak with you and say, set, set a timer of uh, uh, five minutes, um, you will typically say, uh, sorry, uh, how, how, long, how, how long the timer uh, lasts or what, so say five minutes and now, the timer is three minutes, four minutes, two minutes and 30. You probably say to me, uh, it lasts, you still need to wait uh, two minutes. Hmm? Uh, instead, notice what is saying this thing. Um, computer, quanto manca il timer? Il tempo residuo per il tuo timer da cinque minuti è due minuti e 40 secondi. Computer, cancella il timer. Uh, so, timer da cinque minuti cancellato. So notice what is saying. So uh, how long the timer still lasts? The answer is your five minutes timer last will still last two minutes and something. So this is our repetition that is uh, actually a good thing and actually answer to some guidelines for, for of Amazon, for instance, to remember the user what is the action, what is the, the things that the user is going to uh, to ask. So the timer was five minutes. So the first thing to say is your five minutes timer. And if we ask the weather uh, in, what's the weather in Turin? The first thing to say, the weather in Turin is or will be. Well, if we speak with another person and say, what's the, the weather in Turin? The other person say, it's sunny or it will rain without the risk specifying again, the city or the day. While these things by default, and this is a good practice for voice-based interaction, specify again the details, just to be sure that you first remember, and second, that there is a good match between your request and what they understand. So this is a sort of feedback. If you say, what's the, the weather in Turin? And the answer is the weather in Milan will be, uh, you, you immediately understand that there is a problem in communication. Another example is this time a negative example. Uh, what's on TV tonight? Um, so I can ask what's on TV tonight. And if I ask what's on TV now, tomorrow, uh, I will not have an answer. So this is again, problematic because it's, it's not what I'm expecting to, to work, uh, this thing to work. So if I'm asking what's the time, what's, the, uh, what's on TV tonight and I have an answer I'm expecting as a user in my mental model that this thing is able to answer uh, for also tomorrow or for this afternoon, just to, to know about television, instead, no. Uh, it just gives no answer, uh, wrong answer only. Uh, instead, if I ask what's on TV uh, tonight, it will, it, it, will, it will answer correctly. Um, another example, I, I would like to, to uh, I'm going to ask about recipes what I can cook to, tonight, for instance, or uh, some recipes. Uh, computer, dimmi qualche ricetta. Bacchetti di peperoni sul letto di rucola. Okay, I'm asking for some recipes and just say one recipes. Um, it's not what, what I wanted. Um, let's try. Computer, quali sono le ricette più popolari? Ti potrebbe piacere risotto all'arancia con spada e gamberetti, stelle, biscotti, di Natale, pollo con i funghi, ciambellone della nonna, pasta con broccoli, mini stigrano saraceno con tonno affumicato, baita di savoiardi, zuppa svuota frigo, passatelli in brodo. Cosa vuoi cucinare? Stop. Ciao, porta già lo zafferano sempre con te. So this, this application of Jalo Zafferano actually uh, work not, not very well from, from this perspective, from the voice perspective, uh, because it doesn't say that the recipe is from Jalo Zafferano, just say in the end, like an advertiser. And if I have to ask you, uh, which is the second recipe that uh, suggested to me, you are able to say what it was? Me neither. And so this is actually a problem that, that, that again, the, the extension of Jalo Zafrano that I didn't install, by the way, so I don't know why 
it's by default is connecting to John Zafferano. But um, this is actually a, a, a violation of the Amazon guidelines for creating voice interfaces for, uh, for Alexa, uh, because the, a, a list of items should be provided with some numbers and with some spaces and some uh, say relax between one item and the other. So they should say the first recipe is like it for the weather uh, that we said, the first recipe that I'm going to suggest to you is something. The second recipe is this and having a short list like four or five item only, not longer than four or five because otherwise you the person the risk not to remember exactly what is specified somewhere. So a little bit of repetition is, is fine and also help people to understand and to remember things. And, uh, um, and, and so you, you also have to design this kind of interaction in a specific way. And then you have some option that you can, you think you can ask and then you are not going to, they are not going to work. So this was just a brief uh, exploration of uh, uh, Amazon Echo, but most of you according to the chat has some experience with uh, Google Assistant or other things. The, the, the difference here is that you don't have a screen. And so the only way to interact with this thing is by voice and uh, received by voice. So if you have Google Home or uh, an Amazon Echo, you have already experience. If you tried with your smartphone, you have the difference that that is a, a, um, a screen first device that also have speak capability. So the things are a little bit different because you have a screen and you can also see things on the screen. So you can see a list of uh, elements on screen while here you cannot see anything. You just have this light feedback and this four button and then everything else is just by voice. We will use this brief experiment and eventually we will also have other experience tomorrow for uh, the exercise in which we will try to apply that the guidelines for evaluating uh, these AI device. So if you have any question, please write in the chat. Otherwise, have a good uh, dinner and have a good night. And we will see you tomorrow at uh, 11.30.